All right, fantastic. Um, to open this evening, I'm going to flip it on over to Jill. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you all uh, to our portfolio event uh, this evening. Um, I'm just going to do a quick introduction on the Emerging Conservators Committee, because as you might see, um, I am the chair of the Emerging Conservators Committee. Um, and who we are is a branch of the Canadian Association for Conservation of Cultural Property, or CAC. Uh, we are responsible for promoting the interests of CAC members just entering the field of conservation. We strive to accomplish this by facilitating knowledge transfer among emerging and experienced conservators, as well as by providing information and resources relevant to emerging conservation professionals. Uh, since its formation in 2009, the ECC has developed a diverse portfolio of projects and initiatives, including a successful mentorship program, which is just about to launch a new season, our bulletin interview series, an annual emerging conservator symposium, and managing the CAC sponsored membership program. Uh, the best place to follow us is through our Facebook page uh, or the CAC's Instagram page. And if you have any questions or suggestions to, for us, uh, feel free to reach out through social media or by email. And I'll actually just pop some links in the chat while we uh, get going. And I'm gonna pass everything back over to Madeline. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jill. Uh, my name is Madeline Smolars. My pronouns are she, her. I'm calling in from Treaty 22 territory, um, traditional territory of Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in Oakville, Ontario, Canada. Um, I am the founder and co-administrator of the Emerging Museum Professionals Canada Collective. I will toss our website in the chat. Um, we're a volunteer-based organization um, of EMPs from across Canada. There's about 10 of us right now. And um, our mission is to foster an environment where emerging museum professionals can learn from one another, collaborate with each other and advocate for themselves, their peers and their role in the museum culture and heritage sectors. Um, the statement as well as um, our guiding terms is on our website. And I encourage you to follow us uh, on Instagram at EMP Canada. And now my dog wants to jump off my lap. Um, and we also have a Facebook group over a thousand members strong um, for those looking for community online um, outside of this event right now. We're thrilled to be uh, partnering with ECC. Uh, and I have to hand it to Jill because this was her idea. Um, and we're very pleased to present uh, the perspective of four different individuals, two emerging conservators and two emerging museum professionals tonight, one of them being myself, uh, in talking about portfolios. Um, the first presenter for the evening is Ali, so I'm going to flip it over to them to introduce themselves, and I'll also make them host for screen sharing. Over to you, Ali. All righty. Thank you very much, Madeline, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, so to begin, everybody, hello. My name is Ali Singh. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am an emerging conservator currently based in the National Capital Region. So I'm currently working as a collections management clerk at the Library and Archives Canada based out at the Preservation Storage Facility out in Gatineau. It's an incredible new facility, um, and I'm incredibly grateful to be part of the team over there. Now today I will be uh, talking about portfolio design and layout, and I'd first like to stress that I am not a graphic designer in any way, shape, or form. And the portfolio that I'm going to be showing you today has been in evolution since 2018. It began as an assessment for one of my grad school classes and has since carried on through to the present. So I'm just going to share my screen now and we can plop over to see those examples. Oh, and I didn't start my timer, starting it now. There we go. There we go. Okay, so let's play this. Got some last minute admissions. There we go. All righty. So why can't I move to the next page? There we go. <laughs> there we go, folks. So here we go. 
So this is an example of a portfolio page that I have built in InDesign. I divided the page into two sections, the navy side, which explains what the object is, and the white side, which showcases all of the treatment that I did to it. All of my pages follow essentially the same layout. They have the title, the dates, and the project descriptions on the left side, and the treatment pathways along the bottom, with photos taking up the majority of the white space. Now, by creating a uniformity in design, not only does the portfolio look polished, but anyone looking it over will immediately know where to go for any kind of information they may be searching. A prospective employer might, wanting, might, might be wanting to see how long it took me to do all of the treatments that I've presented in a portfolio. Immediately, the eye will go down to the bottom corner, the bottom right-hand corner, where I have the total time listed. Now, this is really intentional. Um, I wanted to make sure that I was following an example set for me by one of my previous professors, Jane Henderson. She said, and I quote, this is a tool to use in job interviews. Design it to make the reader's task easier. So that is really my coda when it comes to designing pages. So my design intentions really were to have a clean, clear, and detailed portfolio page. In fact, pages that could be carried into an interview in physical copy. So when I created all of these in InDesign, I actually set them as an A4 size paper template and based all of the measurements on that. So that actually meant that I was kind of restricted in a sense to the font sizes that I used, the clarity of the photos, the color choices, um, et cetera, because I wanted it to be something that could be printed. And I have in fact actually taken these pages to Staples and had them printed and carried them into an interview. So that's pretty great. Now, Restricting it to the specific size, as I said, made, made legibility a key component and also meant that you really had to get to the point quickly. If you're carrying this in in person, someone's going to look over it really briefly. They're not actually going to want to get into the nitty gritty of it and read the whole thing while sitting there in front of you. Now, I would also like to take a mention about photos. You want to make sure that you're choosing photos that illustrate a wide variety of steps as to what you're doing and wherever possible, you wanna make your before and after photos uniform. So as you can see here in this page, my before and after photo frame the photographs that I have and they are uniform in the layout, in the coloring of the background and the scale along the bottom. This was intentional. Now I've also wanted to be really sure that I was laying everything out in a way that looked clean. I am, as I said, not a graphic designer. I really don't know what I'm doing. I took one class, oops, Whereas I can't see my remote, there's my button. Oh, submit this person. Okay, there we go. Um, now I took one digital design course when I was at Algonquin College, and that is really the basis for what I know how to do. Everything else I've since learned from the school of Google and the school of YouTube. And so essentially, it really needed to be simple, something that I could recreate in the future. And what I did, what I will definitely recommend, is I just essentially created a blank template. I have an extra file where it's just the color block, just a couple of text boxes with a little bit of text in them ready to go so that when I get another project that I know I want to turn into a portfolio page, I can just clone what I already have so I don't have to start from scratch every time. This has actually saved my bacon a couple of times when applying for jobs for a posting that I've seen maybe last minute. And I know that they might be looking for something really hazard focused or something really textile focused, I can whip up a page in a much shorter amount of time and save myself a lot of stress by having these templates pre made. Um, my understanding is that Canva also kind of does something similar, um, but I haven't actually used it, but I would definitely recommend playing around with any tools at your disposal. Now I'm going to pop over to another page of mine that I have. Oh my gosh, there we go. Now, you can see that I have changed the layout a little bit. The structure is essentially the same, but the navy side is a bit wider and the photos are surrounding the captions instead of below them. Nonetheless, it's clear that these two are from the same portfolio. And I made the changes that I did so to limit white space as well as include a longer description. Now you'll find as you make portfolio pages that you're not always gonna have photographs or descriptions or treatment pathways, whatever, that are the same size from page to page. So don't be afraid to play with how things are laid out on your page, but just make sure that you are keeping a uniform design there so that people can look at all of your pages together and say, this is from one person. They've put in the time, they've put in the effort. You wanna have that subliminal messaging underneath so that potential employers can actually say, yeah, I have an understanding of who this person is. Now, 
I wanted to showcase my conservation abilities, but I also wanted to say, look, I'm detail oriented. I am organized and I care about what I'm doing. And I'm hoping that all of my portfolio pages say that based off of the amount of time that I've put in. Now, one last thing on this page I'd like to show you. You can kind of see the little pop up just at the top of my um, navy box there where I've got a color palette. So what's great about all of the Adobe suites is they have the little eyedropper tool where you can select a color and then it'll auto populate a whole bunch of different color palettes for you. Now I did this, I saved this palette into my Adobe libraries and I have then used it to create further portfolio pages that are different from conservation. So that way I can have a spread of pages over a whole bunch of different projects that all come back to a same kind of circular um, idea. They look polish they look put together. So as an example, I have this one on packaging. I'm currently working on my third collections move. So I've had to have uh, portfolio pages about packaging ready to go just to show what I can do. And so I used the burgundy color that was in the previous one, as you can see here, in the text box. So what I've done is I've said, hey, these are two things from the same portfolio, but they're not the same kind of project. I wanted to use design to say different things, but I wanted to use the same design to say different things. Now, this was something that um, I had the great privilege of learning in the digital design course that I took when I was at Algonquin. Um, props to Mike, uh, our professor, for teaching us that. And really, you don't have to be really super talented or like super skilled with these kinds of programs just to get them to work. I often find that simpler is better in order to make sure that you can actually get your message across. Now, one final thing I'd really like to mention is um, AODA compliance where you can. Now, the AODA is the Accessibility for Ontarians with, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. And one of the things that they have in their guidelines is just the kind of text that you can use to make it easier to read for people who might have um, dyslexia, for example, or um, other kinds of, of um, learning disabilities. Now, one of the things that is there in the guidelines is to use a sans serif font in the text block. Oh, I can't see my mouse. There we go. Is to use a sans serif font in the text block and a serif font for the headers. Now, you also want to look for high contrast as well. You're not going to want to put yellow writing on like pink text or like a pink block behind it. You just can't read that. That's pretty much impossible. This is going to help prevent eye strain and provides a much more pleasant reading experience, which isn't something that a lot of people think of. But when an employer or an HR manager is looking at your portfolio, they're going to look away quickly if it's one that they're having a problem reading, right? They're not going to put in the time to sit there and read your whole text block if they're having eye strain trying to do it. So just take a second to consider those kinds of things. And I learned all of this essentially with a quick Google. You know, I, I just learned, I just, I think I just Googled accessible design and it just came up with like a list of things that I could do to make, make this kind of stuff easier for people to read. Um, so I would definitely recommend doing that if you have, uh, if that's something that you want to consider. And if you are keeping a digital um, digital portfolio as well, then I would absolutely recommend adding in um, not metadata, like captions into your photos and alt text as well, so that screen readers can then see, or pardon my language, so that screen readers can then read off what somebody would be seeing in a photograph. Now, this is something that I would like to embed in my PDFs moving forward, and that's something that I plan to do in the future. But it looks like that is my time. Wow, 10 minutes is fast. And um, I'm going to attempt to get out of the screen sharing. And da -da 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 -da. is it frozen? Is it not frozen? There we go. OK, we're, we're, we're back. Um, Thank you very much, everybody, for listening to my design presentation. Uh, I will take questions at the end. Feel free to just drop them in the chat. We will be moving on to Celine next, who is presenting on, if I can make that. Oh, no, I totally lost it. So we will be <laughs> moving on to Celine next, who will be gracing us with her presence and with her incredible presentation. Thank you, everybody. I'm Ali Singh. Bye. Thank you, Ali. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, yes, as a reminder, everyone can put in their questions into the chat. Um, 
or you can message Jill privately and they'll be accumulated at the end for the Q&A session. I'm just sharing my screen now. Um, hopefully you can all see my PowerPoint presentation now. Uh, so hello everyone, my name is Celine. My pronouns are she, her. I have a script with me because I don't wanna forget anything important and uh, I know my time speaking will pass very quickly. Um, but I just wanna say that it's a pleasure to be speaking at this uh, evening's webinar on professional portfolios. So thank you to the Emerging Conservators Committee and the Emerging Museum Professionals Canada Collective for having me on this little panel tonight. Um, I'm joining this webinar from the Anishinaabeg lands, which are the traditional and treaty territory of the Chippewas of Georgina Island, as uh, many other nations whose present here continues uh, today. I am grateful to live and work in this Aurora region, which is part of the treaty lands of the Mississaugas and Chippewas, recognized through Treaty 13 and the Williams Treaties of 1923. I have lived in this region all my life, but I also live in Istanbul part of the time uh, with the remainder of my family. I am a Turkish Canadian glam professional or galleries, libraries, archives, museums professional. Um, I completed my Master of Museum Studies and Master of Information from U of T or University of Toronto in 2020. Uh, you might also know me as the current co-chair of the Group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals or Go EMP, uh, following uh, Madeline's tremendous leadership. Um, I'll keep my intro brief for time's sake, but just to add that in terms of work, I'm at the Aurora uh, Historical Society at the moment as Programming and Outreach Coordinator. Um, I also, in my personal projects, am an artist, a writer, uh, and independent researcher. Uh, generally, I continue to love appreciating and you know, investigating, respecting, and uh, sharing knowledge related to culture and its diverse manifestations. So uh, tonight's platform for my portfolio is going to be my website, and I'm kind of going to showcase all of those titles that I was just mentioning to you today, but focusing a little bit on the museum side. And I'm also going to talk about some adjacent platforms that I have that are related to my portfolio. They all sort of work together. So moving through quickly, I took screenshots of my website so you can follow along with me very easily. So when you get to the homepage here, you get a banner at the very top. That is my personal photography. So that is my artwork there. Um, it is symbolizing a Turkish uh, coffee cup there on a pashmina, which is an example of Turkish material culture. Uh, coffee cups representing fortune telling, um, the good that is to come, as well as companionship. So some uh, hidden meanings there, as well as the colors, bluish, bluish uh, turquoise, white. Those are all colors that represent Turkey in addition to red. Um, so again, I'm reinforcing my cultural identity here that I am very proud of. Um, and then again, as you can see, I try to keep my website clean and minimal. So the additional complementary colors that I use are a dark gray, which is something that you typically find in museum gallery walls that are meant to emphasize, again, the content that is being presented and not take away from uh, using the design. Um, so as well, I am using Weebly, the free version of Weebly. So uh, I have to keep that banner that's in the corner there throughout my website, which is fine um, because that's all I can afford. But the platform also lets me do everything that I want it to do. So um, that's good enough for me right now. And as you scroll down, you see my picture, you see a little welcome message. You also get um, my hellos and all three of my languages that I speak there. Um, the Welcome message invites people to stay a little while. It's a little bit of a, um, you can say, <clears throat> hospitality greeting that is very typical of uh, Turkish people. Um, usually if someone's, you know, at your door in your house, you wouldn't, you know, shout out them, you know, welcome from your bedroom, you would actually get up and go to the door. So here is my portfolio representation of me a picture of me welcoming you at the door, right at the homepage, um, as well as if I had the updated version of uh, a paid website, I would have made my website, to be honest, av available in all the languages that I speak. Um, but since I'm not able to do that just yet, I want people to know that um, I welcome them to engage with me in those languages. So it's very subtly there, right at the introduction page. Um, moving on in this section, right at 
Below it, you'll see what's new happening with me. So of course, tonight's webinar is up there um, so that you know that I'm up to doing that. You also get to see the new lecture that I have available that I can now give to other institutions um, on material culture, followed by my capstone uh, exhibition project, which is a virtual exhibition that continues to exist in the online world. So I have that still there um, for other people to use or peruse, you can say. Um, I should also mention that all of the images uh, are have alt text, uh, as well as all the images hyperlink to an external um, uh, to its external resource. But in case that's not uh, immediately explicit for the viewer, I also sometimes have buttons um, to encourage people to click on and go to those external pages. Um, so that's also there. Moving on to the next tab, the My Work tab, uh, you get to see a little taste of everything that I get to do, starting off right away with museum work. So I, again, try to keep it minimal, um, showcasing just a little explanation on, you know, some of the key places that I've worked where I had a prominent role, um, as well as, you know, pictures and things like that. Um, at the very, uh, towards the bottom of that page, you get my writing, my, um, academic journal article that I had published, uh, all relevant again to my museum work, followed by my selected blog articles. And the key word here is selected um, because I don't want to overload people with information. I actually want to encourage them to reach out to me to get my full CV. Um, and selected is actually a very key word that you can use in case you don't have a lot to showcase. Uh, and it gives the illusion that you have um, a lot to choose from, but maybe I only have uh, three written blog articles. So that's a, a little trick there that you can use in the future. And at the very bottom, you get a quote from me that expresses my opinions on culture because it is relevant to my museum work and my writing work. So that's why you get it at the end of this page to kind of wrap up. And it connects to the next section, which is talking about my artwork. Um, you are met with my artist statement on the left side that is a, a more personal uh, expression of what uh, inspires me in my in my artistic work um, and you get a quote from me on the right side again the same formatting matching the previous quote that is highlighting one of my favorite Turkish expressions but again that has a very um, deep influence on the kind of work that I do and I want to share that with other people so it's representing my authentic self at all times because I want people to get to know who I am as a person um, so that's why you have that there. And then following that section, you get just a little so selection of what my preferred artwork is. So you get uh, my painting, photography, sketches are my main mediums of art. Uh, you also get on the right side a snapshot of some of my um, artwork and it kind of works in this carousel moving um, format because I have a fear of people stealing my artwork from, um, through digital platforms. So um, because I don't have the fancy website that prevents people from doing, you know, screenshots and other copyright copy paste issues instead you have my little caption at the bottom saying pretty please don't take my uh, artwork from my website but also the carousel helps um, uh, discourage people from taking screenshots since the picture moves uh, constantly and in the last section you get the about me section so you get my uh, biography you get a different picture of me um, you also see again selected presentations that i offer tonight's webinar being one of them now um, you also get uh, selected awards and recognition because i feel like that's important and that's worth celebrating um, and then at the end you also get my contact information and the links to my other platforms i should emphasize though that the the email that i have listed on this website is only explicitly for my website use um, and this is because I'm also worried that uh, if there's ever an issue with my website um, and it disrupts the email or some kind of spam content whatever might happen it's isolated to just that one email and it's easy for me to shut down and restart again it's not connected to my main email address um, so there's that Wrapping up, I just want to talk about how this kind of plays into the other platforms that I have and the kind of intentional uh, messaging that it brings to the table. So here you get a, a screenshot of my Instagram, um, which continues to act as another marketing platform. Um, I sometimes 
shift it to private, even though it's a public account, just to keep the, the um, viewership under my control. So I do a little sifting every now and then. Um, my Instagram also connects to my link tree, which has all of those little key shortcuts to those uh, resources that I am presenting in my website. Um, so again, very minimal information, but I encourage people to go in and dive more and explore more. And then my LinkedIn, uh, again, has the same kind of information being presented consistent throughout all of my platforms. All the bios look very similar. Um, so there's that as well. And it acts as more of a uh, developed CV than my website does. But again, still not my full uh, resume. Um, I also screenshotted here my uh, business card because I think it's important on the front with, again, my photography with my name and titles. And on the, the back side, you get my personal information and contact information there connecting to my other platforms. Um, there are some key features that I'm going to wrap up with in relation to how these all connect to each other. So this looks like a lot. Just stay with me. Um, you can see that the front image of my business card is the same as what is on my website and is the same as what is in my personal lecture that I offer. Um, and that's because these are all my creations. Uh, so I'm trying to emphasize the brand here. I'm trying to make the connection between my name, my identity, the messages that I'm bringing um, into the field or the missions as well that I want to represent and, and work towards. Um, I also want to point out that my name has accents in it. Um, and in Turkish language, without those accents, they are pronounced very differently and mean very different things. So Whenever the font allows me to, I include those accents and I also include those um, sort of audio sounds on how to pronounce my name. Um, and that's because I don't want people to feel deterred um, from approaching me just because my name looks a little different than uh, what most other people do um, in this area. So uh, I want to, again, you know, teach people um, through this kind of information, who I am, my authentic self, and I don't want to apologize for who I am, and I instead want to share it with others. Um, lastly, my pictures. You probably noticed that I have a lot of the, the same headshot going around. I honestly don't mind when people have portfolios with different images of themselves, um, but again, for me personally, I want to I want people to get to know me um, and my face. So I try not to change up like the image that I have um, on all these different platforms. I try to keep them all consistent, my professional headshot. Um, so again, that they learn my face, they learn my name and uh, the kind of museum or generally glam professional that I present to be as well as artist, writer, et cetera. Um, so I hope that that, you know, gives a little bit of an example of what uh, you could see in a museum portfolio. Um, thank you for your, your patience and your attention. And I'll pass it on now um, to our next speaker, Cassidy. I'll just admit this person one second and I'll stop sharing. Here we go. Cassidy, my friend, you are on mute. Check. Sure, no. Um, my name is Cassidy. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a semi-recent um, graduate of the Cultural Heritage Conservation and Management Program at Fleming College. Um, I am currently working at the Provincial Archives of Alberta in Edmonton. Um, I've been very fortunate to be on contract there. Um, for over a year now, probably going, it's probably getting close to about two years now. Um, so that's been very fortunate. Um, my intention of my presentation today of my portfolio is to uh, show you how to, I guess, maximize um, the amount of information you're providing while minimizing it content wise on the page uh, for ex accessibility purposes. Um, and also to show you what a very beginner stage of a portfolio is in comparison to the very beautifully well put together ones you have seen so far. Um, so mine is once again, very bare bones. I'm just gonna start my timer now. 
All right. Um, I'm going to quickly just touch on content before I actually share my portfolio. Um, I do want to emphasize that less is not always more. Um, and don't sell yourself short by trying to condense or not conclude everything that potentially contributes to your level of knowledge and skill. Um, just make sure the portfolio is well organized, that it's still easy to navigate and not overwhelming with the abundance of information that it contains. Um, it is helpful, and I personally found this extremely helpful, to have an outside party like a supervisor. Um, give it a once over to see if there's anything that you may have missed or not included. It's easier for us, our, us to sell ourselves short and not recognize all of our own strong suits that a supervisor might notice. I definitely noticed that with myself. I put my skills and my experience far less than what a supervisor would actually consider my capabilities to be. So that was very helpful to have. Um, and to focus on including what may be a priority at the moment if you don't have the time to include everything. As we all know, portfolios are very, very time consuming. Um, they're a lengthy process to develop. Um, so if you are in the process of applying and looking for jobs and you do want to be able to use your portfolio, just try and include as much information as you think is gonna be beneficial to you for any job applications. Um, and then focus on that as much as possible. And then and slowly everything else will come together as you uh, work on it. Um, especially if your portfolio becomes a little backlogged on content. So maybe make a priority list to slowly chip away at adding rather than trying to take it all on as a large project at once. Um, but make sure you have included the most important aspects that you think or know employers will be looking for and the rest can be supplemental. Um, also important, have others take photos of you while you conduct your work, not just of your work. Um, having actual images of yourself and not relying on stock images online for filler images on your pages is much better to have. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen now. Um, okay, is everyone able to see that? Oh, looks good. Okay. Um, for some reason, the chat just popped up. So let me just get rid of that. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, okay, so this is my personal portfolio. Um, I did decide to use Wix. Um, however, I do encourage you to try out a few different portfolio design platforms to decide which works best for your needs um, or that you find easiest to navigate and, des um, and design. Um, so I, like I said, I chose Wix, but Weebly and Squarespace are also two that I've heard really, really good things about. Um, I did give them both a try when I considered maybe starting from scratch and creating a new portfolio. Um, and I did find that just because I had some previous experience with Wix, since it's kind of what I started with, it was just the easiest option to use. So I decided to stick with it. Um, I would also say um, watch tutorials uh, for better navigation of tools and design options on the website that you choose to use. Um, I already know for a fact I'm not using Wix to the, the greatest of its capabilities. Um, I'm still learning with it and watching tutorials definitely helps you realize what you are capable of doing. Um, and it may even show you options that you did not know were available at all. Um, you can also use outside websites such as Canva or InDesign. Um, for design layouts that can then be inputted into your portfolio, if that is easier for you to do rather than navigating what's inside the website itself. Um, it can also help. I'm very much a vis visual person. Um, I like to write things down, make lists. I'm very much, I need things to be drawn and written down in front of me. Um, so it can also help to draw or map out what you would like to include in a layout um, so that it's more easily to visualize as you design it on the website. Um, so for the actual organization aspect of the portfolio, um, you'll see here, this is my about me page. Um, I do, uh, since I went to Fleming College, I do have base treatment knowledge um, with various different material types. However, most of my experience has been from the provincial archives at this point. So I do make a point of noting that I have more advanced experience with paper photographs and books. However, I do have the base treatment knowledge for other material types that I have listed here. Um, I list what some of my professional skills are, and then I also um, listed what some of my conservation treatment skills are specifically. Um, and these are all things that I will then showcase and other aspects of my portfolio. And like I said, have people take pictures. As you can see, a lot of this was during the height of COVID. Um, so unfortunately, masks photos are a thing 
on portfolios now. Um, so <laughs> lovely to include. Um, I am still at the process of redesigning this. So what you may see are a lot of bullet points at this point. I haven't fully published this yet. Um, so I'm still working on it. Some of these bullet points might turn into paragraphs, uh, better, more well flushed out um, description. But as of right now, I just wanna be able to get the content onto the page uh, so that it is easier for me to alter later. Um, so it is good to add extra well-labeled tabs or folders to make things well-organized and accessible. Um, however, try to avoid the endless pit of tabs within tabs. Um, that reduces the likelihood of that content getting seen or explored because the further that uh, an employer has to go into pages, the less likely they are going to want to do it. Um, so as you can see here, I have my conservation experience. Um, and then underneath, I have a pages for specifically um, more um, specific to material types. Um, but if I just click on conservation experience as it is right now, it will take me to how I previously had um, this page designed. Um, so this was an example of how I chose to design it previously. Um, so this is the steel uh, draw knife that I previously worked on. Um, I have this button here, um, which uh, will take me to the condition report separately. And that will have been a document that I inputted into the website um, that will open on the person's computer uh, separately outside of the website. Um, I gave a brief treatment summary and then I gave some before and after treatment photos. Um, I had this all on one page and then I think my issue was that this took up so much space that it was going to be hard for me to figure out how it was going to showcase more treatments without it looking like a lot of information. Um, so I'll show you an example of what I decided to do instead. Um, so if I go into the photograph repair treatments here, um, here's an example of a photo album I worked at. I worked on. I have my before and after photos um, in a slideshow here. But if I go back to this first page, um, you'll see here at the top, I have a treatment summary button and I have a condition report button. This, if you click on them, will open up a page to a specific treatment summary document that I'll have uploaded. And then condition report itself will also pop up if you click on this button. Um, and then following this, I'll have other examples of photograph um, treatments that I've done. Um, you'll see it as well on objects treatments um, as it loads. This is that same draw knife. Um, I've altered how I've decided to present the information um, into this slideshow. Once again, a few before and afters, um, but also has separate buttons that will give open it up to a treatment summary and condition report. Um, this is all personal preference. A coworker of mine said she liked how I originally did it because uh, she likes having all of the information right there in front of her. Um, and whereas I found that to be a little bit overwhelming and I did find it hard to figure out how I was going to organize it in the future um, as I added more treatment um, information. So this is the option I kind of went with. Um, so having those attachment uh, links is very helpful. So I have a lot of them in my condition reports. Um, so if you click on this button, it'll open up the full condition report, but this allows it, me to um, give you various different condition reports that I've done on different treatments um, right off the bat. And I have separated this as well into um, condition reports I've done at the Provincial Archives of Alberta and condition reports I did while I was at Fleming College because those layouts do look different, different places condition report differently. So I like being able to show that I have a well-rounded experience of different types of condition reports. Um, so I liked do it, dividing it up like that. So this slide is gonna have everything from the archives and then this slide is gonna have everything from Fleming College. Um, and I like also how I laid it out here um, with the tabs at the top because it does give employers the ability to choose what they want to look at. So if an employer is prioritizing the fact that you're capable of doing a condition report because that's something that's more important for the position they're going to hire you for, then they can go straight to the condition reports tab and just look at those specifically rather than having to try and go into the treatments, find a condition report there, yada, yada, yada. Um, so I liked breaking it up because it does give you an opportunity to try and alter it more towards uh, an employer's needs, um, which makes it a little bit more accessible to them. Uh, it's easier for them to navigate. It's easier for them to find specifically what it is they're looking for. 
Um, I do also have a page here that has my, sorry, my timer did go off. I just have a few more minutes of information. Um, so I'm gonna quickly breeze through that. Um, I have my conservation photography here. So obviously photographs I took of um, artifacts, objects. Um, and then I also included a sub page of recreational photography just to show that I have like a well-rounded experience. Um, this is just some of the photography I've done while doing some brief traveling. Um, and I'll include more, obviously I'll add more. I did also include a page for research experience that I've done. Um, so that includes any research papers, um, any short papers, any, um, any type of like research and report that I've done, whether or not it be very long or just a small info note, I have included here, um, including a um, YouTube video um, that I did, the very unflattering screenshot I took of that, um, that I did for the archives as well. Um, so like I said, honestly, include everything you've done. Everything's going to be more, uh, make you look more impressive to an employer. Um, and once again, they can pick and choose what they want to look at. So they don't have to look at everything, but it shows that you have a well-rounded um, level of experience and skills. And they're going to like to see the fact that you've included that as an option for them to look at. Um, yeah, so then I also included my CD, CV, a few other things. Um, so I would say my final takeaway um, for building a portfolio is that it's a slow and lengthy process as it only continues to grow as you gain more experience to include. Um, it is something we are constantly updating to be most relevant to your skill, skill set and experience level. So it's not a one and done type of scenario. You are always going to be editing it. And this addition to it may force you to completely alter the format as well. So that's never going to be a constant. Um, don't stress yourself out about making it perfect right off the bat. The inclusion of information and accessibility will always be most important and visual aesthetic can come second as long as it's organized and the information's there. Um, and as you apply to more jobs, you can alter your portfolio to reflect what you find employers tend to be looking for most. Even if this varies from employer to employer, you will begin to see some repetitive requirements that you may choose to include or focus um, and build upon more if you already have it included. Um, all right, I am going to stop screen sharing. And that is my presentation. I'm going to um, hand it off to Madeline now. Um, and here you are. Change house. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, my goodness, I'm closing out this evening. So I don't know exactly how I'm going to do that. I'm reevaluating everything I've ever done now when it comes to portfolios. <laughs> Maybe you are too. All right. So I am the host now, so I get to share my screen with you all um, because like other folks in this meeting, um, I also have a website um, portfolio. Here we go. Perfect. If someone could give me a thumbs up that they can see that okay. All right, thank you, Celine. Okay, so welcome to my online portfolio. Uh, I'll speak a little bit to design, content, and messaging, but I will spend a little bit more time talking about content and marketing yourself as well through your online portfolio, using it as a platform to perhaps get yourself, you know, additional work outside of a typical job. Uh, so this is my website. Um, like Celine, it is powered by Weebly. Thank you so much for being free <laughs> and for being pretty user friendly in terms of the back end of things. Um, I have laid my website out um, similar to Celine in the fact that my home page is really a welcoming page, um, introducing myself, orienting uh, the person viewing my website about where I am, what my interests are, and I invite them to explore the website um, and then of course direct them as well. Um, a little bit of descriptive language can be really helpful for people using screen readers. Um, so kudos to my partner for taking this photo. If you get someone who you know and ideally who you like <laughs> to take your photo, you'll look a lot more natural. And so um, kudos to my partner, Ashley, for taking this great photo of me. Um, you can see in the upper right hand corner, I've got my name and my degrees, which is a very typical Western thing to do. I'm proud of them, so why not? And it is a header that carries across all of the pages. 
Um, I will say in terms of the design of the website, I found this background image, which actually, if you scroll down a little bit, is from Kingston, Ontario, where I lived for about four years. Um, and I just, I loved the color and the feeling I got looking at this photo so much that I wanted to sort of carry that out or carry that throughout my website. Um, the top here, you can see there are a number of different um, titles, essentially, or things that I am um, that people can click on to check out my website. And actually, I'll pop my website URL in the chat right now so you can go and take a look if that's easier for you later. So um, first and foremost, this is a professional website. So I am a professional. I am a dedicated museum professional. <laughs> and um, I very luckily found imagery on Unsplash that really matched the color theme and feeling that I was looking for and was relevant to me as well. Um, I am half Danish and this was a place that I visited last time I was in Denmark. So this is similar to a resume, but really slashed down. Um, as a professional, I have received a couple of awards and I'm super proud of those. So wanted to throw those up on the screen. Heading on down, I then have my professional museum and gallery experience. You can see that right now I am Oakville Gallery's office operations and financial manager during the day and I do this at night. So it's like my superpower. Um, I do have hyperlinks to the places where I've worked just in case someone wants to learn more about that specific place and um, having hyperlinks also increases the searchability of your website. So I will keep on going down here. Search engine optimization SEO is definitely a thing. Um, I decided to break up the space with some photographs of myself. Oh my gosh, baby Madeline on a dig in 2013. I always forget about these pictures um, just to show, like Cassidy mentioned, you know, myself doing things, myself in spaces. Um, and uh, it's just also a lot of fun to look back and remember. I then add um, additional professional experience. All experience, honestly, is relevant, um, but I do stress museum, gallery, um, archive and library experience a little bit more. And that's why it's at the top of the page. I'm also a volunteer. So like I said, you know, I do things on the side. Um, I'm a passionate community volunteer. And then, of course, I explain the significance of that image. Um, I am on the board of directors of the Canadian Museum Association. So if you have any gripes about the CMA, let me know. My inbox is open. I want to hear it and I want your you know, thoughts to be represented. Um, I was also on a board in the U.S. for a hot minute. And then I have... And this is a problem of mine, a lot of committee experience. <laughs> so I've listed it all. Like Cassidy said, you know, all experience is important. And why the heck not list it all? Um, so again, similar in design, there goes my dog, uh, to my professional page. I do have um, a bar of images just to break it up and to show um, my kind of visual involvement in these different things or a selection of them rather. And then because it's important later in my website, um, I do have volunteer editorial experience and um, museum specific volunteer experience too. Mm -hmm. I wanna talk about my education um, because I strongly believe in lifelong learning. Um, I'm My other half is Polish, so I had to do a shout out to Wawel Castle in Warsaw uh, where I was in 2018 with my brother. Um, so I have here, just as a different format, recent courses, recent conferences, again, select or recent is also a way that you can um, make people think that maybe you've done more than you actually have, um, similar to the trick that Celine shared earlier. And then heading on down here, um, got my actual education, some specific awards that I received during that time thinking about reformatting this a little bit and then some pictures um, at the bottom um, again baby Madeline oh my gosh graduating seven years ago um, so then the next thing is that I'm a speaker so um, like Celine I want to feature that I'm an engaging public speaker online and in person so I give a little bit of a preamble and then launch into all of this stuff, um, which again, I link to all these different organizations and I highlight who I um, presented with, especially if I was a co-presenter. So here's some conference presentations. 
some, oh my gosh, what have I been doing? Um, these are images from recent um, conference attendance and presentation. Um, there's my good friend, Celine. And then um, heading on down to online individual presentations. I've got one that is upcoming. So I put it there to show that, you know, things are happening, even if they haven't happened just yet. It was a little bit of a teaser. And then um, online panel presentations. So there is a difference between speaking as a part of a panel and speaking as, um, a, as an individual as well. I should add this to this page now as well. And then moderation is something that I offer too. Um, I do have videos, uh, samples essentially uh, of myself presenting just to you know, have some hard evidence. I've done this and I can do it fairly well. So that when you get to the bottom of the page, I can tell you how much I charge. And this is something that's really important. Um, as you move forward and you become a more established professional, uh, you really should be paid for your work. And so this is also a great way when people are asking me for free labor, labor, I direct them to my website and I say, these are my fees. I do deliver some pro bono presentations. I consider that part of pay it forward and volunteerism, but in general, um, especially larger organizations that you know have the budget for it, um, this is one way that you can back it up. Um, so these are actually fees that I have been paid before. So that's also another way that I can back it up. And then heading towards the end, um, I love to write, and uh, it's definitely a passion of mine. Um, I'm a trained academic writing advisor from my time at the University of Ottawa. And so um, similar to Celine, you know, I've given some examples, uh, links, direct links to different writings, um, wherever possible, if they exist online, just send people right on over there. Um, and it's a link that will open always on a new tab. You never want someone to be navigated away from your portfolio, like, you know, it transitions to the other site within the same tab because then they might not go back. So that's definitely something good to do when you are hyperlinking. All right. You'll also notice all my hyperlinks are the same color and it's that kind of beautiful warm mauve that I have throughout the website. And then why not have some testimonials of people that you've worked with? Um, you can read this when you're feeling down, um, but it also really is its kind of like when people give kudos on LinkedIn or um, are able to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically, there's a professional word for it, but there's a section on LinkedIn where you can gas somebody up and say like, yeah, I recommend them for this and this is what they're good at. And I worked with them on this um, really just as like another way to show that you did something successfully. And then blog writing experience, of course, a little bit different from publications. So I've classified that differently. And then um, I do have some editing and um, employment coaching service fees as well. Um, so this is also something that I get asked to do a lot and that I have a lot of experience in. Um, but again, I don't want to be taken advantage of. So these are very fair um, pricings, but essentially um, you have to think about what your time is worth and um, what you deserve to be paid. And you can always ask around if you're not sure how much you would feel comfortable being paid for something because it's very easy for museum professionals to devalue themselves. Imposter syndrome is real, y'all. And um, push back, punch it in the face, <laughs> tell it to leave you alone. All right, and then heading to the last page, because I know I'm pretty much out of time, is my contact page. So again, carrying through that nice, warm, welcoming color tone story and making sure that it's high contrast with the white. Um, that is kind of throughout my pages. I always chose an overlay text color that was highest contrast as possible. Um, and I've got my sans serif font throughout for the most part or very, if there are serifs, they're pretty mild. Um, I just have it very nice and simple. 
there's my email, there's my LinkedIn, Instagram, and then it's like a direct um, icon to email as well. So it'll open up in a person's preferred email platform. So really the message that I wanted to get across to you all is that um, a portfolio can also be a platform for springboarding additional side adventures for yourself. Um, I actually am starting to, because of my work in um, career support and coaching and uh, fighting for fair wages, I am very likely going to start to do that as a consultant um, on the side in addition to my day job. There's a whole other issue around museum people having to take extra work um, to live. But that's a whole other webinar, and maybe we can talk about it. <laughs> so I am going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, we do have about 10 minutes for questions. We're not like a hard stop at, um, at the hour. And uh, I know it's likely that Jill has been keeping track of them in the chat and uh, in private messaging as well. Um, so Jill, I am going to turn it over to you to facilitate that. And I will also make you the host just in case you need to share your screen. But thank you all so much for being here. All right. Uh, okay, well, uh, I want to thank everybody so much for those great presentations. Um, I know that it really takes a lot to put yourselves out there and uh, show what your work is and uh, be open to the critique, mostly because I know I myself was really hoping I'd find two conservators who were willing to share theirs because I wasn't ready for it. And that's okay. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions they want to throw in the chat um, or uh, wants to raise their hand and speak, but I do see a question in there. Um, are any of these websites password protected or is that not a privacy concern? Uh, so I don't know. If any of you were, no? Um, I will say mine is not password protected and there are no areas of my website that are password protected. I'm not sure if that's a feature I can flip on with the free version of Weebly. Um, I know there are platforms that can do that just in case there is maybe like culturally sensitive information um, that should only be viewed by certain people, for example. Um, but then again, if it's that culturally sensitive, should it be going online? That's a question you can ask yourself too. Um, yeah, so Lynn, Ali, and Cassidy, do you have passwords? Mine is not. Um, I also don't really include anything, I guess, that would need to be password protected in my personal opinion. But I do also think that if there is any possibility, like if I was concerned about, um, for example, my research paper um, for my final semester is like 40 some odd pa pages of research that I did. If I was concerned of like copyright um, concerns, I would maybe consider because it's included in as like a clickable document that will open up separately, I would maybe consider putting a password protection on the document itself. Um, Cause you can usually do that through Word or something. You can do it so that it's password protected. Um, I would maybe consider doing it that way. But aside from that, I do find portfolios are supposed to be um, a purse, like they're supposed to be accessible. So I feel like putting password protection on anything would kind of remove that aspect of a portfolio as like a public representation of yourself. But yeah. All right. Um, and you, nobody else says, I can pop in and say, I have a Squarespace and they do have the ability to password protect might be useful in the future for me because I just started working at an Indigenous led organization. So um, we have a question that I don't even know. At what point do you stop calling yourself an emerging museum professional and just stick to a museum professional? I think that's when you get a permanent be... job. <laughs> I was gonna, I, I feel yeah. like there's... That's, what I, that's what I'm telling myself. <laughs> they try and put a, a, a date. They try and like, I think they're like, oh, three to five years. They try to actually oh. like, yeah, they try and actually put like a number on it. But I feel like, like Madeline said, like 
um, imposter syndrome is very real. Um, and I feel like that factors into how long it's going to take us to maybe consider ourselves a museum professional and no longer emerging. Um, you could literally be in the profession for over 20 years and still get imposter syndrome. So it's, it is really hard to figure it out. I think it is very much a personal um, preference and how secure you feel in your position and your knowledge. It is also a field, like at least I feel personally as a conservator, where it is constantly changing. We are constantly learning things. So it's hard to determine whether or not you are new and fresh. And like, it's hard to determine where that level of knowledge is knowing that you are going to be constantly learning throughout your entire career so like it is a very hard question to answer but I, yeah the, I think it's like five years is what it's supposed to be I've I've looked at it and number of institutions so I had a coworker say once you've worked at three different institutions then you're no longer emerging because you've been around the block um I have I think four or five now under my belt and so I suppose you could say I don't consider myself emerging, but several of those were while I was in school. So I'm counting from graduation onward. When I hit a third institution, then I'm no longer emerging. That's how I'm going to count it outside of permanent jobs. But we know how rare, how rare those are. So. Yeah. I can add to that very quickly and just say that um, I've heard a combination of both. So roughly, you know, five years is a pretty good mark that uh, people like to go with. But also, you know, by the time I was five years out of school, I was already at 10 different institutions. So, um, you know, whichever, you know, variety of institutions you want to say a variety of roles or a variety of um professional levels you can say too if you've been through you know not just always intern but maybe you've been assistant as well you can add those two um and count that as a as separate um or or developed experiences but again like everybody is saying it's uh spiritually you know like when do you feel you are a professional when do you want to call yourself a professional and can you back it up so if you can then go ahead and just call yourself a professional rather than an emerging professional go for it i believe in you <laughs> if you say it with your chest dare yeah. to, to counter you you know <laughs> oh, i love that i will say um when I joined the Group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals Committee or Go EMP Committee. Um, they had kind of already for themselves to find what an EMP was, and it's still on the website. And it's pretty much someone who's within the first 10 years of their museum career, which in that case, I could still be here. <laughs> um, but like others in this um, presentation, uh, I would consider it pretty much from graduation on then again if you're a lifelong learner you could go back and do a micro credential you could do a course like I did a course through the um, Ontario Museum Association just to brush up on my collections management um, but it's really yeah emerging is a state of mind and it's it's how you feel um, I would call myself a, a, a professional a worker um, first before I say emerging but in terms of like my people and you know my community I still very much feel enmeshed in the EMP community and that's also why I founded EMP Canada Collective because I didn't feel like there was one nationally and that it was really lacking um, so I think I'll probably still be here for a little bit but I definitely do feel more emerged um, or established um, I had someone who was like almost retiring being like, I think I'm an expired museum professional. And I was like, oh God, I hope not. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for that question, Aaliyah. I know you're in Kingston uh, with the Civic Museum. So cheers to you. I know what that's like. Um, over to you, Jill. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I think we could probably have a round table discussion of 45 minutes on that one. Um, <laughs> So, but uh, we'll bump along. Um, how did you get around photo reproduction permissions for the places you were working in? I can't share any stuff from my old job, which makes an online portfolio complicated. Um, I so I have an answer for that one. Yeah, so um, I was the only one who presented not with a portfolio website, but with actual portfolio pages. I also have an online portfolio, um, which I did not have time to touch on tonight. And I'll, the content is mostly the same, but I actually got around this by having those actual physical copies. Now, as as emerging as conservators applying for jobs, you're typically asked for um, uh, treatment or packaging or or you know things that you've done. And 
every time I go to a new workplace, I always ask right off the bat, what is the limit? What can I take and what can I use in portfolio? What are the things that cannot be shared publicly? What are the things that I can share in a portfolio? And what are the kinds of things that cannot be shared under any platform? Because what you share in a portfolio that you're only sending to a prospective employer like the pages that I've created has very different permissions from what you're putting online for the, anybody in the world to see. I have been able to get around some of those um, photo permissions because the portfolio I send out to um, hiring managers is not for public consumption, essentially, and it is not for like any monetary gain. Like I'm not selling anything with it, right? So it's, uh, so yeah, that's, that's how to get around it. But always make sure that you're checking in as you're working on projects. What can I use? What can't I use? Typically, if you take the photo yourself and it's of something that is in the museum's collection, that's fair game. If it is something that it's like of the ground, of people working, so long as you have permission of the people in the photograph, that's usually fair game. But um, as Joe mentioned, anything with some kind of cultural sensitivity, especially indigenous belongings, those are the kind of ones where you're, you shouldn't include right off the bat. You want to be making sure that you're always asking, even if you think, oh, it's been on display in the museum, maybe just check again, just to be sure. Check with your managers, check with HR, check with communications if you can. That would be my recommendation. Yeah. And to like further that, like I haven't had that issue. Um, luckily so far, because m everything I work on is part of the archives personal collection, um, which once again, like Ali said, it's fair game. However, I do have to take into consideration, like one of the research papers I did um, link onto my research experience um, is a um, some research and an assessment I did for a public client who actually brought baseball cards um, to the archives and wanted to see whether or not they were authentic. I wrote up like an eight page assessment for him, which was definitely more information than that man wanted uh, because they were not real. So he was not getting any money if he tried to sell them. Um, but my supervisor made sure like you didn't include his name in the report, right? Like if you are making this public, make sure like you didn't include his name, which I'm pretty... I definitely did not. Um, and we do have a private conservator who works out of our lab, works through the store at the archives. That's how she gets her clients. However, if she's to share any of her, any of the work she works on, or if the archives is going to share any of the work publicly on her behalf, she does have to get individual permission from each client that she's getting the work from. So like, there's definitely like touching in. Um, and like Ali said, like, always making sure before you start working on something or before you post anything that you do have specific permission from whoever, whomever is like personally responsible for it. I think too, for myself, um, particularly on things that I've worked on, um, I've taken photos just for my own documentation. Uh, so often if it's photos that I've taken on my own device, especially of like public areas of a museum or office space that no one would be super duper offended or concerned if I shared images of that. Um, then it kind of the, I guess the intellectual property ownership is with me um, more so than my institution. Um, that being said, like there have been a couple of times where I've had to like Google an image for a portfolio that, you know, I instead then gave credit to the actual owner of that photo instead. Um, a lot of the header images on my website are from Unsplash, uh, U-N-S-P-L-A-S-H, um, because it's open source essentially. Um, but uh, definitely something very important to keep in mind because you don't want someone tapping you on the shoulder later and being like, uh, 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 um, you really shouldn't do that when you've like gone to all the trouble to put this portfolio together. Um, and also, sorry, I was, I just want to add on, um, for you, as you're saying that it was your previous contract was very restrictive. Um, in scenarios like that, I would almost ask as well, is there anything that you can give me to work on that I am not restricted on sharing? Because they do need to acknowledge that you are trying to develop a professional portfolio 
that you do need visual aspects too. They re- they need to recognize that for your future career and your best interest, you do need to have some things you can share. So even if you ask if there's at least one thing that you can work on or focus on that they're not going to restrict you on, if you can do that as an option as well, just because like it, I said, um, okay, <laughs> well, in yeah, future then, but yeah. I'll just mention um, I'm where I'm currently working at Library and Archives Canada. I'm I'm undertaking a collections move project where we're not allowed any photographs at all in the vault of the collection of the collection spaces. Like we're we're essentially not allowed to take any photographs at all. So what I have done on my online portfolio as well as in my resume because it's all everything's reflected. Just as Celine said, it's all one big brand. Um, is I have written my my uh, security clearance into the description of the job. And as such, I have indicated that this is a place where there's no photographs allowed, right? So next time I go to update my my portfolio, I have a tab where I have like other skills and collections management is what is one of them. And I will say again there, like no photographs allowed in this area. Please ask me any questions you have about working with this collection. Just like indicating it and kind of, I don't want to say hitting people over the head with it, but just making it very obvious right off the bat that this was a place that I did work at but I was not allowed to take photographs. And I recognize that there is a blank space here where there could be, but there will not be. And this is the reason why. I'll just add one very small point um, because I think what Ali's saying is uh, especially very important. Um, But uh, I'll also say that I also worked at an institution where photography was not permitted at any point. Um, But right towards the end of my contract, I requested a photography day. Um, So I had a colleague of mine follow me around doing my sort of everyday tasks in and take pictures of me doing those tasks in within the restrictions that we all know that we were able to work within. Um, But everyone knew at the site that that was a day to also, you know, take pictures so they know that I have permissions and I'm going around specifically within my guidelines to take pictures of myself working because other professionals also recognize the importance of photography and you know tracking uh, the work that you do so that's uh, something else that you can also do Um, yeah excellent all right Um, so I don't know I think uh, really I think that's kind of our time we're uh even well past nine o'clock so I want to uh thank everybody for coming uh there we go as I change hosts uh thank everybody for attending and I'm going to pass things over back to Madeline Wonderful. Thank you all so much for joining us. Oh my gosh, this has been incredible. Um, I've learned a heck of a lot and I think um, I'm not overstepping if I say that everyone else learned a lot here as well. Um, I did put again in the chat the email address or email address URL website address for Emerging Museum Professionals Canada Collective. Uh, which is E-M-P-P-E-M, en français, uh, canada.wordpress.com. You can find us on Instagram at EMP Canada. And then Jill has very kindly put uh, Emerging Conservators Committee information in the chat as well. Uh, you can find them on Facebook, um, emergingconservators.cac, um, or of course on the CAC's Instagram account as well and the CAC's website. And there's also also an email for them to ecc at cac hyphen accr.ca uh, just in case for this recording people can't see everything in the chat I want to make sure that that was known um, but definitely look forward to um, more content more events coming soon from both ECC and EMPCC alike um, I know that our group is looking to recruit shortly and uh, we also have some ideas coming up for different events so stay tuned for that um, Jill's group does a fabulous work we're putting together basically like a symposia every year, um, different events. They help contribute to the CAC conference. So 
absolutely check them out. And for everyone who joined this evening and everyone who registered who was unable to join us, this recording will be uploaded to um, EMP Canada Collective's YouTube account uh, within a week and emailed out to you all too. So I'm going to stop recording and the presentation and I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day and week. Thank you so much.